opportunity of these discussion groups, thanks to those who organized it. I was able to join each group briefly, and I was very stimulated by the, firstly, the in intensity of the discussion. Secondly, that there was a juxtaposition of views from the perspectives of different countries, views from the perspectives of different experts, a nice facilitation by the facilitators by and large, uh, altogether exactly what we hope will happen in these dialogues. And now I'm going to invite the facilitators to share the magic of their dialogues, to give a feedback partly on the progress of work, but really I want to know the feeling of your group and you can personalize it or you can try and share it on behalf of everybody. Uh, and then if you can just send a, a little bit of time talking about one, what needs to happen in the next two to three years for the vision that you're working on to be achieved. What are the priorities? Who needs to be involved? How to make sure women in particular are involved? Uh, how do we know when we're successful and what obstacles are we likely to face? But remember, your job is to present to the rest of the group something that will make them sit up and that they will remember. Don't just give a chronicle of what has happened. So we're going to invite Audrey Nep Nepview of IFAD, either herself or delegating to somebody else, to feedback uh, from discussion group one and you have four minutes and I will time you and you'll hear a ping when four minutes are up. Audrey, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it was, uh, I had the, the, the honor to, to facilitate a group of uh, very committed people. So it is really a challenge to, to share back with uh, the level of engagement they're taking in their daily work that they had the, the, the generosity to share and to put in perspective. Uh, what we were looking at was uh, what came out and uh, there was a common agreement there that there was a, a mismatch into the, the link to, um, to the, 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 how we relate to the natural resources. And uh, we need to bridge this back to bring, to bring this link again. Uh, this is where uh, business as usual will not work anymore. So that was our entry point. And we were sharing, the, the, we had the, the, the sharing of uh, ex very diverse experiences. Um, in order to reach the, the systemic level that we need to build an understanding to, to, pre to shy away and to, to turn away from business as usual, where the first limiting factor uh, was uh, that we were discussing was, uh, was we miss data. So that is officially internationally recognized, but we were looking at uh, what are the priority ones. And uh, there it's, uh, the, so the first action that is needed in the coming years is to really map it out, to understand, to build a common understanding, to share it, uh, to, to bring in the, the local uh, communities, the local people in, the, in this discussion in order to build this systemic understanding. Um, and there, um, there is this uh, discussion about a wake-up call. Uh, the, how do we stop and sp stop, look around, uh, spot what can be done better? Uh, we're talking about uh, irrigation for food, uh, uh, for food production and ensure uh, safe, uh, safe food for everybody. There we have tools that are already existing. Uh, there, there are some low-hanging fruits that can be uh, that can be done. Um, so they, there is this level of awareness that we would like to the gov respective governments to to reach uh, the because the solution already exists. So we need the data in order to propose an informed picture so that the awareness is raised and action then can be taken. Um, there was a dimension of uh, legislation, uh, laws and regulations, also uh, in the, to represent the interest of nature so that we do stop impeding on the natural processes that are also restore, uh, restoring the, all the, the, the negative impact that, it's, uh, that we are having as a human species. 
and we've seen the reversal of it uh, during the COVID time, I think. In the first, uh, first month, we were looking at it a little bit. One minute left, one minute left. Mm -hmm. And we do have the indicators to monitor as we do so. Uh, the water productivity for the food production. Uh, we can also ensure that all the water is being at least reused uh, because to stop food waste uh, and post-harvest uh, losses. So we do have the means. It's all about bringing it together and getting a different level of understanding at systemic level. And I will close with that. Very, very lovely. Um, did you feel that your group was held together nicely? Was it a very coherent group or not? Yes, it was. We were so diverse. There was uh, rivers, there was youth, there was innovators, there were uh, past, uh, it's, it was really diverse, like from a city to a rural. But you got uh, on okay. You were able to reach some was, degree of convergence. Yes. I enjoyed your facilitation. Thank you so much. I like it. I like the way you're saying, we got the ingredients, but we need to really uh, shift the understanding. And that means awareness. Uh, data, a new narrative, and just getting it actually out there. And I, I mean, we can do this. I don't think it's impossible. Thank you, Audrey, for your leadership. Let's now go to the next group. Uh, and um, I'd like to go to Sibella Stern from the Australian Mission. Your subject is Sustainable Consumption Patterns for Water and Food. Over to you. Sibella Stone. That's right. Good morning, everyone. Hello. Um, so just quickly, um, I'll share our sort of our vision that we were discussing, which was that water related consumption patterns of all stakeholders in the food systems, from consumers to industry and producers, optimise water use for processing and packaging, food loss and waste to ensure sustainable access to clean water for healthy people and healthy environment. So we had an, um, an excellent discussion. Um, I have to say a group um, that really represented a, a, um, a cross sector um, of um, people and movements engaged in water and food um, and environment more broadly. Um, I think we, we started off by identifying some key obstacles to achieving our vision. Um, and primarily they were around, um, I think, um, uh, what the previous um, facilitator talked about, about um, really a lack of understanding um, at all levels really of water and of the value of water, where it comes from, um, where um, the products that we enjoy um, come from and, um, and their use of water um, and how intensive, um, water intensive some of those products can be. Um, we also talked about not really understanding some of the trade-offs and how um, successes, for example, in, in one water sector or one part of the system um, are creating failures in other in others. Um, I think um, one of the key things that came to light was um, really a lack of agreement at all levels on what the key priorities in water are. Um, so for example, um, in, in climate, we have 1.5 degrees. It's really clear that we're all striving in, in that direction, um, but we don't sort of have that in water. And instead, what we really have, I think, are um, are different different um, parts of the sector, different sectors pulling in different directions. Um, so people sort of mentioned, for example, um, uh, you know, that some parts see wash as the, the most important component and others have identified transboundary. And as long as we don't have that one single um, North Star was the term that was used, um, we, that, that's a real barrier to success and it is hard to determine what success would look like. Um, so really um, a lot of work to um, break down some of those silos and to bridge the gaps um, there. Uh, we, we really talked about um, one of the drivers here, particularly around um, behaviour change, is, is around people power. Um, people mentioned that, you know, water really wasn't ever kind of a front page issue um, and so how to raise the profile um, and, and bring water to the level where, for example, the current climate discussion is at. Um, so uh, some people identified success as, um, I guess, 
um, the highest levels of leadership, political leaders, for example, were um, were named, having a clearer idea um, of, of what their policy would be. I guess um, for leadership to have that North Star um, and for that to be really driven by um, evidence and evidence-based um, and for it to be really pushed by people power and by, I guess, um, a uh, 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 an empowered um, people, people at all levels from um, industry, consumers, producers, um, all understanding the place and the value of water um, and making those evidence-based um, decisions um, working towards one kind of central goal. Uh, that's it for me. That's pretty cool. Thank you very much indeed. I noticed you really tuned into this apex target idea, but did you think a bit about how that's going to be appearing? Did you go further on that or did you just really concentrate on the fact that we need such a target? I mean, I think we um, we talked about the fact that that target is in fact very complex, um, partially because um, water does have so many kind of different right. um, origins and uses and needs, and and so the the to get to that single apex target is yeah. going to require quite a lot of political trade offs that will mm -hmm. be difficult decisions for leaders to make. Okay, we hold that. Thank you. That was absolutely beautiful. They're tough, these apex targets. I just went through an apex target for nature exercise. And, uh, uh, you know, on the one hand, you can, you feel you can easily hit on one of these things, and then you keep hearing all the exceptions. And that's why water is so complex. Super facilitation again, Sibella, oh, wonderful. Let's now move to our next group. And uh, uh, we're going to talk about boosts or increases in nature positive production of food through water management, Ruhiza Baroto, you have the floor. Four minutes. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, we had a very good uh, discussion. Uh, our dream or our vision was uh, integrated watershed and agro, agro ecosystem management allows access to safe, pollution free and sufficient water for food production and human consumption while preserving or regenerating environmental water requirements, forest lakes, groundwater, and recharge. So what needs to happen? Our group uh, agreed that uh, there is a need for awareness raising, for people to understand the issues at stake, and uh, really to also be aware of the solutions that are emerging. Such solutions include uh, new technologies such as non-conventional sources of water, uh, such as uh, the nexus uh, between water, energy, and food, uh, the need for policies to be in place. In fact, in some places, such as in uh, Morocco, they're already implementing policies to facilitate the adoption of such new technologies, such as non-conventional sources of water. Obviously, financing is something that is always required uh, to make sure that it's an enabler for, for, ch for change. Uh, who needs to be involved and to commit to actions? Governments obviously need to be involved. Researchers have a lot to provide, and we recognize that uh, in this group there is a lot of good capacity, good research happening. Uh, the private sector has a role to play to complement governments. Uh, indigenous communities have got uh, uh, a role to play because they've got knowledge that can assist uh, in achieving sustainability. Financiers, of course, that still have a role to play. And obviously, at the center is the farmer who is both a consumer and a conserver. Uh, who, uh, how do we make sure that women and vulnerable people are all empowered to benefit from the initiatives? Again, awareness raising is key because uh, very often uh, the vulnerable people don't know what is available to them facilitating access to finance to women so that they can have access to technology for uh, irrigation. Uh, if necessary, provide subsidies, although subsidies is not a response to everything. Yes, food is a right, water is a right, but it comes at a cost. Uh, we need to facilitate exchange of experiences between communities, between uh, groups that have got different technologies. How do we know that we will be, how do we know we'll be successful? Uh, 
the indicators will be, of course, uh, in our group to make sure that uh, the food is produced, uh, water is conserved so that it remains available for future generations, that the water quality does not uh, deteriorate, and that uh, there are less conflicts uh, over the management of water resources. Uh, what obstacles are we likely to face and what might be done to overcome them? Uh, around the new technologies such as non-conventional sources of water, there are psychological barriers where people resist the adoption of such technologies. Uh, there are policies that are lacking, so a good policy framework needs to be put in place. Uh, financing uh, is always a challenge. Again, that needs also to be put in place. Uh, I would stop there, but I will really have to thank the group for the very engaging discussions and the fruitful contributions. Thank you. And Rohita, at the end of the day, do you think that your group has found some of the answers to the vexed problem of getting better water management in food production? Yes, definitely, yeah. definitely. So one of the issues, for example, was technologies. Uh, if you can apply drip irrigation, uh, it will allow you to reduce uh, the amount of water that uh, you, are, you are wasting on the crops. Okay. If you can make sure that the farmers understand where and how much it needs to irrigate uh, specifically, yeah. that will make sure that, uh, in fact, we do uh, optimize the use of water. Now, uh, I, if we... Yeah. Sorry, keep going. No, uh, the same applies to making sure that uh, the communities are empowered and that they are given access to all kind of technologies. Really? Thank you. Now, you see, I like it because the group really definitely honed down on one vital thing, that if the right people get the technologies into their hands, then they can be active. The farmer is the primary actor. I loved it, the way that group really honed in. I mean, and you did many other things, but I just wanted to com commend you on, on that focus. Many more things to say. We're going to group four, Roberto uh, Lenton, Advanced Livelihoods and Equity Through Safe Water. Roberto, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much, uh, David. We had a, a great topic um, and a great uh, group. Um, and, the, and the topic, as you said, uh, David, was on livelihoods and equity and how to advance it uh, through safe water. Um, and it was really an opportunity uh, to engage along the lines that we had discussed in the opening session of how to make sure that uh, what is not taken for granted becomes uh, an integral part of the conversation, a part of the narrative. Um, and we really, uh, the group really grabbed the opportunity to come together around, around these issues. Um, we, uh, we had an, uh, an extremely, uh, in my view, outstanding group, uh, extremely diverse, uh, very wide experience, both in terms of regions of the world, uh, but also the kinds of organizations they worked in and the kinds of topics that they dealt with. Um, but really what struck me when I went through the bios of everyone is that everyone in the room were change makers of one kind or another, really uh, living up to this, <clears throat> this title of this session on uh, water, the game changer for food systems. And everybody really uh, um, you know, uh, lived, lived that, uh, that in their own lives. Um, so my sense was this was a really uh, engaged group. Um, the topic really meant a lot to everyone there. Um, diverse but coherent views. Um, and my sense is that we could have probably gone on discussing if you hadn't brought us back to the uh, overall session. I think we could have gone on discussing for a couple of hours or more. Um, and uh, we'd still be going at it right now. Uh, in terms of the substance, um, we started with some broad issues that really go beyond this session, and it's for the dialogue as a whole. Uh, one, the importance of having a really broad vision of what food systems uh, means, because the broader you look at the food system, the more that you see the interconnections between water and food. Um, very important to look at both production and consumption issues. Um, and that connects, of course, with, 
with food waste and, and the recognition that food waste in the end is, is water waste. Um, there was a lot of discussion also of uh, the need for partnership with farmers that came up in one of the other sessions. Um, farmers in the end manage 70% of the world's water. It's not irrigation agencies and, and, and water organizations that manage the water. The bulk of the water in fact is managed by farmers. Um, important to look at the connection of trade uh, and water because trade in food in the end uh, is trade in water and that's uh, really important to keep in mind in this connection. Um, and one of the participants emphasized the point that I think is truly important um, is the role of indigenous populations um, in terms of, of users, but also stewards of water and, uh, and land resources. Um, now then, in terms of the specific issues of equity and livelihoods, we had some very interesting discussions. Um, <clears throat> You've got 16 seconds, sorry for that. Oh, very good, okay. Um, we had very good discussions from a human rights perspective and also very good, uh, very specific examples of innovations um, in both Israel in, on the one hand and Ethiopia on the other, and I could go on uh, at some length beyond that. Thank you. What a wonderful and lovely man you are, uh, Dr. Lenton. Just to say that from my perspective, the fact that you were very much saying, we're dealing here with systems, the boundaries of systems are, are for us to define. And what this group may well conclude is that the boundaries of food systems need to be wide enough to include all the water dimensions, production and consumption. And that's a very, very valuable point uh, that Roberto, you and your group, uh, seems to have brought out. Most grateful to you. Did you enjoy it, Roberto? I did. I hope everybody else did too. Uh, yeah, well, we could uh, 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 um, do a poll later, but I mean, I, I, I just want to tell you that I, I really, once again, I, I love the way all of you facilitated. Thank you, Roberto, for showing your, your, your discussion group the way to go and helping them all go along that route. Let's go to group five. You were talking about building resilience to vulnerabilities, stocks and stresses, and Stefan Ullenbrook was the facilitator. Stefan, your four minutes start now. Thanks, David. Uh, we, we had a really interesting discussion in our group. We had a diverse group, um, different um, colleagues from different continents with different backgrounds, uh, different, um, yeah, representing probably different groups of society, I believe. Uh, it was very constructive, was very pleasant, a good atmosphere. And um, if, if you don't mind, I, I share with you a couple of broader, wider topics that we started with. And then I, uh, I, I think there were three three main topics that we would like to focus on. So what should happen the next two or three years? Um, we were discussing action track five, and this is, as you said, about building resilience to vulnerabilities, shocks, and stress. And we were entering that from the climate change angle, at, at least some of the contributions went in that direction. And well, it's nothing new to this group that climate change often is felt through the change of hydrology, to the change of the, the, the regime of the rainfall, the evaporation. Uh, fluxes, et cetera, and that, that has multiple implications for the food systems and how to, to increase the resilience needs uh, many things. Maybe different plants, different seeds uh, that are tolerant to drought or salt or <clears throat> salinity, I mean, uh, but also water, we believe, was, was absolutely critical. As, as one of the wider discussions which came up again and again was the, the critical role of regenerative uh, agriculture, which includes including the, the soil organic carbon, including the storage of water in the soil zone and uh, with multiple uh, positive effects on farming. That was one, one of the solutions, but it's not a silver bullet. I think it's kind of depending on where we are, which climatic zone and which socioeconomic boundary conditions, there's a different G -G regenerative agriculture that needs to be applied. But we discussed it a few times. It can also help in rain fed as well as in uh, irrigated systems. And I said the importance about uh, entering the, the resilience discussion from a climate change angle was that um, 
supplementary irrigation can really make the difference between a failed harvest and starvation and uh, a terrible situation for the livelihoods and the people uh, to, to kind of a, a secured food and um, food and nutrition for all. So, so really that, that can make a difference. What we agreed on, even we didn't do the poll, but, but I, I kind of sensed that, huh? that um, we all felt in line with the four introduction speakers that water should be firmly established in the, in the UNFSS dialogue which we, yes, probably we all agree on the call. However, if you look at the Action Track 5 so-called game changers, um, um, I, we Googled that and there was very few mentioning of water. There was only one of the 25 game changers that were suggested actually dealt with water management. And, and so, so, yes, it's firmly connected, but, but on the other hand, we, we, I, I personally, and probably I speak for the group, we're not so sure if it's already represented enough. One more point. Three, three points were made for what needs to happen the next uh, three to five years. First, we talk about the necessary transformation of systems. And uh, a colleague reminded us, this is not necessary input intensive. So needing more water, more fertilizer, et cetera, it's, it's knowledge intensive. Knowledge intensive means we need more, more understanding, more research, more innovations, as well as um, capacity building is absolutely key. So the knowledge intensiveness is, is, um, was, it was a strong point was made. Second, policy. Um, a colleague reminded us on the paradox that we need local action at municipalities, the critical role of faith-based institutions and, and organizations, um, really local actors. On the other hand, the, it, the, the, at the higher regional, even global level, policies need to be set and an enabling environment needs to be established. And the third point is the role of champions. One colleague linked again to the capacity um, building again, and that was uh, well received by the group that we need, we need these change makers, we need these champions who, who can drive that and, and uh, can, can be the, um, the, the movers and shakers for transformative change. Very good, very good. Four minutes, bang. But you're very experienced. You were actually totally four minutes. And you, I think, as far as I'm concerned, gave a very nice a pen picture of how knowledge, local action, wider access to technology and champions are all necessary if you are wanting to make certain that resilience uh, to both variations in water access and uh, resilience to disturbance to food systems can actually be made to happen. And you got one specific point about the game changers. We will hold on to that. Let's go, uh, well done, well done, Stefan. Uh, let's go to number six, to Mohsin Hafiz, intersectoral cooperation to water, to ensure water, food, energy, security. So this is a nexus question, an intersectoral cooperation to ensure security at the nexus and also environmental sustainability. Just a simple question to resolve in 50 minutes. Off you go, four minutes now. I had a pleasure to facilitate the discussion with the diverse group uh, and then the very experienced people from various academic background as well as the research as well as uh, from the donor side and then the farmers group. So we really had a very interactive discussion and then got many ideas which I will be sharing it now. We talked about the topic and then saying how we will considering the water energy food nexus as well as considering the environmental sustainability. So it's important. Some of the key messages are the system level, what we need to do for the next two to three years, the system level incentives for growing agriculture crops in agricultural zone based on a climatic zones. So it's important one. But then how that will be happening, uh, we also need to understand that then water is not used only for growing agriculture crop, but water could also be used for uh, aquaculture. And uh, it's just uh, the cross sector collaboration is very important. And then if we want to understand that from the water system, so we need to also look around that this food system there and they, they are the actors who need to talk and bit more dialogue between those sectors, water system and food system actors are there. And the important is from a science perspective that the simplify the complex challenges of water energy food system through that there's some evidence-based information which could be used to provide the information and then that changing the paradigm shift in thinking what could happen into those areas and then we also talked about there is one critical issue always coming investment in r d is very less and less 
and then we started a bit debate about that one whether we need to invest in the large project or the small project but when we are thinking about the water sector it's important is water is not saying any boundaries so we need to look around the farm system level where we are interacting with the local community farmers women and everything but also at a system level cross boundary issues are also need to be linking up together there so important when we are considering the water is value of water for multi sectoral use if you consider that principle that will help us in shaping up many of that one and then the uh, one of the major constraint is need of policy uh, the policy incoherence between the various ministries at the local level at the federal level at the provincial level how we could improve those barriers for this and bring a bit more policy coherence that will be also one of the game changer on that one and one of the thing we also talked about the capacity building of the farmers at the local level and how we could utilize the new tools digital innovation and as well as technology for irrigation system so that there is a more water available from agriculture towards going to the other one so we could think about the local uh, localized solution nature based solution which is let's say the rainwater harvesting at the local scale level also at the system level that will really provide a direct link is there then not investing a large on the large infrastructure but how the nature based solution could be useful for the potential solution there and important thing is uh, one of the uh, participant highlighted that the we often talked about the sdg 6 but it's there is a need of integration of all the sdg along with the local context how this could be interacting and how do we could utilize a bit more integration there not in a silo approach even in the sdg but having a bit more integration in terms of the obstacles we also talked about there is a one is funding of cycle is always there but also that the lack of the capacity of the farmers at the different levels about what exactly the nexus mean how that could be translated whether it's really buzzword or it's not a really buzzword how that could be translated there and important is that the governance which is capable of that one managing that the the basically that the water energy food issues okay. at the scale level and last is about that the less water Uh, yeah. from the agriculture sector and that would only happen if you use for the non conventional tools yeah. rain water harvesting waste water and everything thank you very much wow 6 seconds left what a interesting i just have to say uh because this was the session the the group working on um uh working on intersectoral cooperation you was interesting how you said that the boundaries actually contribute to quite a lot of the fragmentation so you have to work for coherence across the boundaries and then you said well actually if you use a all sdg frame of reference it makes it much harder to get everything stuck in these separate silos i was i like the way your group really got into uh, multi uh a uh, well, intersectoral working thank you mosin let's go to samara brock uh, the group is looking at governance uh, at the water food interface samara you have the floor for 4 minutes great thank you david yes so our group was looking at the governance of water um to create equitable access and we had an amazing group of participants who were working on the ground in Pakistan, Venezuela, Nepal, Central Asia and Tunisia and there's a lot of energy in our conversation um and people brought a lot of knowledge of their local context um and work in the area to share many of the people in this group have been working in waters in water systems for years and so had a lot of passion and a lot of energy and a, and a lot of specific examples to share um Having said that, I'm going to try and give sort of a broad based uh broad swath of what we talked about, more thematic than specific suggestions, just because I think that'll capture sort of the energy and the feeling of the group. Um first off, we started with many of the challenges that people are facing in the various local contexts that they work in, um things like water shocks, water losses, pollution, climate impacts on water availability, and the idea that even where there is water availability, we don't have good systems in place to make sure that it's distributed equitably. Um from that, we talked a lot about linkages. So water is a complex system um there's links to food and health security and you know there was this idea that it's great that we're here in this dialogue making this 
link that needs to be made between water systems and food systems, but for effective governance for the complexity of water systems, we need to link this as well to health, to energy, and other key areas. And there was a real sense um, in, in this conversation that one of the key barriers to this is that everybody's thinking sectorally. Um, and that is one of the critical issues we identified to overcome in creating effective water government governance. Um, and then this led into a conversation about the importance of participation in water governance um, and how we might go about democratizing it, democratizing it. So one of the key things that people brought up is the need to create neutral processes where voices are being heard. Um, and also um, in, in, in line with that is to really focus on who might have an outsized voice in these conversations. We need to create an enabling environment where each actor um, is empowered to have a role. And this comes from the bottom up. Um, in terms of talking about who needs to be involved, um, there's a real idea that we need to give preference to impacted communities farmers, local users, and also the idea that we need to give priority to the larger environment as well as future generations. Uh, one participant eloquently said that every table there sh should be two empty chairs, one for all the people who aren't there and one for all the future generations, just so we're keeping these in our, in our mind, the idea who else needs to be engaged in this conversation um, and how do we work to ensure um, the prosperity for future generations. Um, so the core to this sort of participation and democratization is that we need to build trust. Um, a lot of the sectoral divide comes from the fact that people hold tight to water resources. Um, and, and the reality that many people touched on is that there's gonna to have to be trade-offs. So we have to have difficult conversations. So we have to be able to build trust. We have to be able to build inclusive processes where people feel that they're involved and that they're empowered to be there. Um, and finally, something we spend a fair bit of time talking about is that core to building effective water governance is to shift our values towards water. And this doesn't just mean a financial valuation of water, but more of a, a shift towards understanding water as, as the core of life. We need to reassess what water is, how it relates to human dignity, what it means culturally, what it means to the larger environment, and what it means to future generations. Beautiful. Thank you very much indeed. Was there something you were about to say when I rudely interrupted you just now? Nope, it was perfect timing. <laughs> but I just point out to you that that was four minutes and five seconds. Absolutely brilliant. And also I wanted, to, I, had, I had three words that I wrote down while you were talking. Trust, transparency, and trade-offs. Trust creates the context within which really unbelievable things can happen. Transparency is a product of trust. You can't have it without trust. You hide if there's mistrust. And then once there's transparency, trade-offs become easier, quite honestly, because if you hide how you deal with trade-offs, then how can everybody understand and be part of the process? And there's so much of your presentation was about uh, enabling. Uh, I felt that that you, you actually had quite a nice internal logic. Thank you very much indeed, Samaria. Uh, then we go to uh, Ambika Jindal and team talking about investments. Ambika, you have the floor. Thank you so much, David. I feel like just listening to the other facilitators, I have a master's now in food security and water. It's been so great to hear the insights from the other groups. Our group was also very insightful. We had a great conversation. Very practical, very realistic, um, very brave. So we said things that we probably shouldn't say. I thought that was really refreshing um, and very frank. So I almost felt like we were in a group of friends who were not afraid. Uh, you were talking about trust and I felt that the level of trust somehow was very high in our group. Uh, so that was great. Um, when we started, we, we were, of course, focusing on investors. How do you bring in investments? And the first thing people think about when we talk about investments is private public funding. Uh, and public-private partnerships have been around for a long time. It's a term we all understand. But public-private dialogue is a whole different discussion. And that's something that we spend some time about is how do we, what language do we use to talk to each other? Do we understand each other? Is the dialogue happening? Because, of course, at the investment stage, it's it's, it's somewhat later in the process, but how do we actually communicate with each other? 
Um, some of the really nice, I think, startling sentences that were put forward. One was, don't focus on efficiency, it's a trap. Um, you know, think about water aggregation. The more efficient you make a process does not mean you always save water. People can then just use more water. So it's important that we don't, you know, think about investments only in water efficiency, but understand that at the end, it's the water use that you're, you know, trying to manage. Um, we talked about holistically thinking about water. Don't isolate water. Don't make it a separate thing. Uh, water is one of the inputs into food security. There are seeds, there are fertilizers, there are so many other things. So how then do we actually make them our friends? How do we make sure that the leverage that these others have in the community of food and water can actually work towards the benefits of it attracting the investments that come in for those other topics that also leverage water security? So don't isolate water. Um, the other was make it more visible. So virtual water, of course, is, is already invisible, but also how does water flow through a system? I mean, where does it go to? Who all does it go to? Uh, who is affected by it? I mean, are we understanding who is affected by every you know, movement of the water as it goes from one level to another? And if we were to be able to understand that and clearly see that, what that would allow us to do is see, is everything that needs to be funded getting funded? Or is it that there are certain elements that are very critical to the success of this flow, which are not getting funded, and therefore we need to create some kind of investment mechanism to make sure that that does get funded. So trying to understand the flow and making the invisible more visible is also something we focused on. Um, on that same theme of transparency, we already touched upon that a little bit better. Um, incentive, create an incentive for transparency. I mean, make it, make it worthwhile for somebody to do such an analysis. How do you do that? There needs to be a reason why somebody would think about benefits beyond themselves. What is the common value of water was another term. Um, just before this intervention, we had the understanding of water is more than financial, cultural, ethical, et cetera. What is the incentive in place for somebody to actually do that kind of understanding? Um, think about linkages, because once we think about linkages, we are able to, first of all, mobilize other instruments like insurance, for example, you can you know, leverage insurance products, but also prevent things that are discouraging good water use. So for example, solar pumping came up. Solar pumping is great for climate, it's great, but, it's, it, but because you're now allowed to use sun energy, which doesn't cost you that much, you might be pumping more water. So what is the linkage? How do we actually link these different isolated actions into one combined action? And uh, the last one of the very important part of points was about the desire to really think about systemic change is great, but sometimes keep conversations real and focus on incremental action. Understand what is a region capable of actually delivering? Who actually needs to do this? Are they able to have the capacity to deliver what we are dreaming or asking them to do? Um, and therefore make incremental understanding of this, try to accept conversations. So in conferences such as the Food Summit and also in the UN 2023, you know, let's not keep it so high level or so overarching that or so over demanding that people on the ground cannot deliver this. We need to make sure that it can be delivered. And that's what also mobilizes investor action because they're looking for very realistic, pragmatic deliverables. And last but not least, how do we engage the youth and women? Uh, I really liked one of the interventions that uh, from one of our speakers who said, you need to give them leadership, you need to give them responsibility, and you need to give them indicators that we can congratulate them on achieving. It needs to be very clear. And once we've empowered them with those three aspects, we can, we can count on their engagement and we can make sure that they feel empowered. So that's a little small gist of everything I could capture. There was so much more, but I'll stop here. Thank you. A lot. Thank you, Ambika. That was very, very nice. I think everybody appreciated that. The, uh, all the feedbacks, feedbacks have been absolutely brilliant and we're going to run out of time. Let's now, lastly, go to Olce uh, Unver to feedback on the Group 9, focusing on innovation and data for water and food systems. Starting now. Yes, um, we had a diverse and a very passionate group. We had um, country uh, representatives, uh, development finance, development and private sector, uh, civil society. Uh, we had a farmer and research and academia uh, represented on, on the group and, uh, and the interventions were uh, not only passionate, but, but complementary and um, with, with some diverging uh, views. Um, they they uh, 
sort of converged under four uh, distinct headings. The, the first one is about uh, traditional knowledge. And uh, we uh, underline the fact that those who possess the, the wisdom and traditional knowledge are usually not a part of the conversation and, and they are sort of detached and they needed to be brought into the conversation. They needed to be reached out. And the ideas was uh, the, the indigenous knowledge needed to be validated and, you know, Technology could uh, could come into the picture, but also uh, standard uh, ways such as farmer field schools with two-way learning could be uh, useful and should be put into action. Uh, disruptive technologies could come out of traditional knowledge or could nicely uh, harmonize with it. The, the second uh, point was about data. Uh, the data being fully open, free and available to everyone. And under this, we uh, distinguish between the, the data being available, but also data being usable uh, because it, it needs uh, sophisticated processing, modeling, et cetera, which also needs to be open to, to available to everyone and groups that use this information and process information and data needed to be bridged ranging from farmers, producers, uh, water users, etc. sometimes overlapping. It was also observed that uh, this uh, effort should, should include not only governments, but heavily uh, technology companies, scientific community, and uh, you know, in the development of analytics, uh, th this should be a wonderful topic to, uh, to look at and uh, become a game, game changer. Under the third topic, we had, or third category, we had specific uh, topics uh, highlighted. Uh, circular economies, the use of circular economies through science uh, innovation uh, has been uh, underlined a few times. Uh, wastewater, water harvesting, uh, water quality, and how to deal with too much water was also mentioned. And drivers that are not necessarily uh, about uh, water efficiency, but important are, are listed as climate change, land tenure, uh, land distribution, and cities. And last but not the least, uh, least uh, softer issues. Uh, policy innovation was underlined by uh, a, a few of our members uh, and the need to involve private sector in innovating policy and not leave it to the, the government governments only. And, uh, and innovation could be used also for managing competition for water, uh, managing the trade-offs involved and with two specific uh, groups underlined uh, as women and smallholder farmers to be looked after. Thank you very, very much indeed, exactly four minutes. And uh, really grateful to you for the structured uh, feedback and in particular for dividing into these three different parts, uh, all of which uh, built on uh, what the others said, but gave a very specific, uh, I would say extra uh, energy uh, and um, I'm now going to give you my very quick summary of what I've heard. I, I'm going to do the summary in five uh, headings. I'm going to time myself because uh, otherwise I'll keep you late. So we're not going to get the water area and the food area to come together more constructively unless there is a willingness to to work and think differently. Business as usual won't do. In order to get to that business, of, as a, a new business, uh, we have to really increase the diversity of people involved in food discussions. We have to keep at all times those who produce food, those who use water, right at the center. We have to make sure that the issues they face are visible because they touch everyone. So that, that bundle of ideas is really about um, uh, 
just being willing to be unusual, uh, to work unusually, and to just to reframe what we're doing. And that brings to the next point that came out, which is we've all got to work on co-creating a better narrative about water. Uh, just as we're co-creating a new narrative about food, we've got to get the water one right. And the amount of work that's having to be done on food is huge. And uh, I think that what we've heard today is we've also got a lot of work to do on water. And that doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with what's being done. It just it needs to be recast uh, so that it touches everyone. There may be helpful if we could find our way to an apex target uh, like the 1.5 degrees on climate. Uh, it would be good in the narrative to stress the indivisibility of water and food and to remind everybody that if you're carting vegetables around the world, you're carting a lot of water as well. Trying to make sure that the new narrative is, is as much focused on people as it is on food or on water. That making sure that it's people-centric and that farmers are seen as the subject, I think is seen by all of you to be very important. So that's the second bucket of issues to do with co-creating a new narrative with people, particularly farmers at the center, with the uh, indivisibility of water and some kind of apex target. Thirdly, uh, we, we then went into some of the practicalities. All of you were really practical on what it takes to get working together. You actually were, were quite precise that this is not something that you deal with with big global statements. I mean, they, they're fine as platitudes, but actually dealing with water and water food is very much uh, down at the local level, getting practical trust, transparency, and trade-offs. And finally, fourth point uh, of my main points, is that you've said that actually this requires incremental work and not transformative work. Uh, so innovations are necessary, and you've got to make sure those innovations are available to everybody, but particularly the business end. But remember, you are going to have to be incremental. It's not going to be done with one big, big change. And that's where valuing indigenous knowledge is absolutely key. Number five, about this dialogue. I just want to say rich, energetic, passionate, and determined to make sure that from now on, water and food are inseparable when it comes not just to public policy, but in local action. So thank you, everybody. We're now going to invite a comment on what we've been discussing, and we'd like to give the floor quickly to, um, to uh, Claudia Sadoff to give us a couple and a half minutes. Uh, and while you're doing that, Claudia, I will just check the chat because there's a lot in the chat that I want to reflect on. So Claudia, please, your sum ups, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. And thank you to all the hosts of this really important event. Uh, it's, it's clear that for those of us who have shared this discussion today, we are all uh, share a deep understanding of the fundamental role of water in food systems. It's clear that uh, for to transform our food systems, to make them truly sustainable and resilient, we need to take action on water systems and that water is clearly a great game changer for, the, uh, for all five action tracks of the summit. Um, what's important though, is that today's discussion also focused on the range of other pressing challenges where water is so important for sustainability, for climate mitigation, for biodiversity conservation, for nutrition, and for equity and inclusion. And we know that water management policies and practices in food systems will have a significant impact, either positive or negative, in all of these critical spaces. And that's arguably the challenge and opportunity with water. Water is so fundamental to so many issues that there is no simple, single elevator pitch apex answer for what we need to do about water rich, writ large. Now, fortunately, we've heard today from all of our eloquent facilitators reflecting some very rich conversations that there are a range of 
powerfully positive solutions in the water space. We know that droughts, floods, and contamination, um, through droughts, floods, and contamination, water wields a tremendous power to disrupt or to break our food systems, meaning that the management of water risks is an imperative if we want to build resilient food systems. We know that at the heart of well-functioning food systems are water systems that have arguably three main components. First, they supply water to the food systems. These are the ecosystems and the infrastructure that provide, store, regulate, and deliver water, agricultural water supply. Secondly, water use in food production, where smart agricultural water management, irrigation, water for aquatic foods and livestock are essential for resilient food systems. And finally, third, water for food consumption, safe water for safe food. The provision of water, sanitation, and hygiene, water waste, water recycling, all of which are necessary to ensure healthy outcomes from food and nutrition. And that all of these rely on the same finite water resource, water resources that are growing rapidly scarcer relative to demand and that are growing more variable and unpredictable due to climate change. And that all of these trends, unfortunately, are generally more pronounced and more severe in developing countries. This is why it's so essential that we focus on food, land, and water systems. We need to acknowledge that water systems approaches are key to evidence-based solutions for managing water and for minimizing and mitigating the trade-offs that we always face in water management. But that these scientific innovations need to be intentionally complemented by capacity building and by policy advances, right. all contextualized to social, economic, and policy uh, changes. We know that we're facing more systemic and complex challenges than ever before. And we know that water runs through all of these interconnections. Yeah. So colleagues, I'd like to close by endorsing a very strong recommendation that the value of water and the key findings of these dialogues are given a very prominent place in the broader UNFSS discourse. I do not feel that the voice of water has been adequately heard yet in this discourse. Well-managed water resources are fundamental to enhancing sustainable, resilient food systems while ensuring that ecosystems thrive. Great. So let's make sure that this message resonates loud and clear as we approach the really tremendous moment of opportunity that the UN Food Systems Summit affords us in September. Thank you. Claudia, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for the quality of that lovely um, end point. Just to say, as I pick up on messages that I'm getting uh, uh, right across uh, the three big things, water and food inseparable from now on. Local really matters. Farmers use and are responsible for 70% of the world's water. Let's make sure they are fully, fully involved in the effort to make sense of the interface. Number three, as Claudia said, transparency is absolutely essential. Let's transparently bring water into the Food Systems Summit with clear narratives and with lots of actors fully engaged. On your behalf, I want to thank all those in UN Water who set up this dialogue. I want to thank the countless people who've worked long hours behind the scenes to make this dialogue possible. Uh, when things go smoothly, you sometimes don't remember how many people were involved. And so I particularly want to thank Charlotte and Cheng and others who've been involved in pulling this all together. And uh, I want to add all the people who I have not mentioned but who have been behind the scenes. I'd like to particularly acknowledge our opening speakers, the two co-conveners, Gilbert Hungbo and Agnes Calabata, as well as uh, 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 our speakers, Yoka Brandt and Mohamed Amin, Mohamed Aminov of uh, Netherlands and Tajikistan, respectively. I'd like to thank all the facilitators, all the note takers. Please, all of you stay involved. Connect to the website www.summitdialogues.org. Get into the Food System Summit Dialogues program. 
It's rocking and rolling all over the world, and you please come in and be part of it. Secondly, look at the uh, manual for conveners, the handbook for independent dialogues and for national dialogues. Consider whether you want to participate in any of the orientations, joining the 2,000 people who've been through them. Create and manage your own dialogues. Participate in all the activities that are going on. And then go to the Food Summit website itself and look into the Food Summit, how it's being organized, the action tracks, because this is going to grow and become more intense as we go into the summit. But I want to stress my last words. The summit is the beginning of a long-term transformation of food systems in line with the SDGs, uh, and in particular, food systems that will embrace all the other aspects of life that are so important for the Sustainable Development Agenda. With this, I thank you all, and I wish you well. Stay with us. We've got a summit in September, and it'd be wonderful if we can count on all of you for being part of that process. Bye-bye. Thanks again. Thank you, Peter. Of course, it's been actually for me an enormous fun moment to be with you all. Lots of people who I've worked with over my life, but lots of others who I haven't met before, listening to you all and sensing the energy and your willingness to do this joining together. Lovely comments from our special rapporteur. Thank you, sir. Lovely comments from people from different countries all over the world. Thank you for taking advantage of this Zoom moment to really have a true international discussion on why water and food are just indivisible and inseparable and key to the future of humanity and of the planet. Cheng Li, I can see you on my screen. Thank you again for all your wonderful efforts. I hope that as you go home, this evening, and well, you'll just think I've done something really special. Cheng, we loved it. And Charlotte Dufour, as we gradually watch people uh, moving off, I know how much time and trouble you put into this moment. And it's from events like this that big systems shifts can actually be traced. Thank you, Charlotte. Raga, Rajab, thank you for being such a wonderful participant. Fauzia, I enjoyed hearing you when I went into the group, lovely, very, very nice work. Thank you again. Um, uh, and uh, I see, yeah, one or two more people who I recognize, Twin Nguyen, thank you again for all your involvement here and for that lovely message, which I used at the end. Uh, Dil Bahadurji, Namaskar. You must be very late this evening in Kathmandu. Thank you for joining us from the National Canning Commission. I also saw Mina Pokhrel, that's a, by the way, that could, Mina could be from Kathmandu, that's her name. So I wonder whether Mina is also from Nepal. There's Dil Bahada, looking at Namaskar, Namaskar. Not here at the office. Thank you, David. Thank you, Jim. I really enjoyed the event. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you. But uh, Dil Bahada, I'm looking forward to hearing how the national dialogues in Nepal are taking forward. I hear rumor that you've got a very exciting program planned.